Hi everyone. Our focus today uh, is uh, around obtaining evidence from the cloud, mainly from the legal aspect. And, uh, and we ask you a, a question before you join the, the webinar is uh, with respect with what kind of challenges you are facing with obtaining evidence from the cloud. And you can see the results uh, on your screen. Most of you address the legal challenge as one of the key uh, elements uh, on one of the key challenges. But you also mentioned the ability to uh, access the data and the processes related to acquiring the, the information. So this is exactly what we are going to, to do over the course of the next uh, 55 uh, minutes. We are going to do some brief discussion around what's uh, cloud uh, data. Then we are going to drill uh, into four main topics about the legal foundation for obtaining cloud uh, data as evidence, who is the owner of, of the data, what are the jurisdictions uh, related to cloud-based data, and eventually we will discuss some of the best practices for, uh, uh, for forensic extraction from the cloud. Feel free to ask questions. We want to have this debate as open uh, as possible. I know that you have many questions, so this is the right time to uh, ask our uh, expert. We will take questions during the, the, the session after each, uh, each part of uh, uh, each topic. And uh, have fun with us, the same that, uh, that, we, that we are. Good. So just to begin the discussion, what is cloud and to put us all on the same perspective. So when we say cloud and when we refer to cloud during the course of the next uh, hour, it will be with respect to the data that is hosted uh, by remote service providers like social media, Facebook, Twitter, web mail, storage service like uh, Google and Dropbox, instant messaging, and even e-commerce. Now, all of us that live on planet Earth are using cloud services. We are using social, uh, social media. Some of the statistics uh, you can find in front of you that about, it depends on, on the region, but let's say between 25% to 50% of the users are active social media users. One of the most interesting um, um, point is that when people are using the cloud, they are using it from the mobile device, which raises a very interesting uh, point, both uh, with respect to the legal uh, uh, challenge uh, of what you can do around the cloud and, and mobile altogether. And I'm sure that we, we will touch some of those uh, points uh, later uh, in this uh, conversation today. So. If standard people like uh, uh, you and me are using uh, cloud, so by, uh, by all means uh, criminals are also using cloud, and therefore the importance of cloud to the law enforcement industry and also to resolve some uh, uh, in, in legal uh, crimes uh, is becoming more and more uh, important. And uh, if by 2010, uh, based on a survey conducted by the International Association of Chief of Police, only 50% of the cases handled the information from the cloud uh, to solve uh, the case. Now it's about 80%, so four out of five cases is actually solved using some information from, uh, uh, from the cloud, which is uh, huge and makes it more and more uh, uh, important. And um, another good reference uh, for that is, you know, the amount of time that uh, the police is spending looking into, uh, into the cloud. So more than 50% uh, is using or looking into the cloud. More than 50% of the investigators are looking more than two or three times a week uh, during their investigation. This is uh, information coming from uh, Lexis, uh, Nexus. Uh, that is an aggregator of uh, uh, information of uh, case loads uh, in, in the U.S. So cloud is very important bo both from, uh, for um, the law enforcement industry, but it's also very important for the uh, uh, private uh, sector. And I know we have uh, some uh, very uh, um, uh, prestigious um, um, uh, firms from the private sector on our, on our uh, call today. So I'm sure uh, uh, you will be able to learn more about cloud investigation in the private sector as well. Good. So put, now that we all know what we are going to talk about, let's start addressing our first question. And it will be with respect to the legal foundation for obtaining and using the cloud um, data as evidence. And with respect to that, what are the legal basis and legal tools that, uh, that are available? Is this data actually admissible uh, and why? And uh, Stephen, would, uh, would you like to take the honor to address uh, this uh, first topic? 
Thank you, Shahaf. Um, in, the, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to look over five individual points. I'm not going to deal with all of, the, all of them in detail uh, because we obviously, obviously have an audience of a mix of uh, people who are interested from the criminal perspective and also, as Shahaf has reminded, the private uh, in sector as well. It's primarily going to be talking about the criminal side, but nevertheless, I'll make some observations regarding the private sector. Uh, some I'm going to deal with very briefly, and one in particular I will deal with in slightly more depth, and I hope you will understand the reason why once I go through it. So first of all, the legal basis. The leg legal basis on which um, an investigating authority can obtain an update or an account, and this will be uh, certainly the same for both private um, and uh, criminal investigations, is consent. Uh, that's the first uh, point to make because it's quite um, surprising how many people actually will give consent for you to obtain data in the cloud. Uh, and that includes police forces as well. Obviously, if you're a police officer, uh, you can obviously obtain a search warrant or a subpoena. Um, but interestingly, you've got to know who to direct that to, either to the owner of the data if there is such a thing, which we'll discuss later, uh, or the user, and also the, perhaps the cloud provider, which is uh, the normal course of events. And one mechanism, of course, of achieving that is through a mutual legal assistance treaty. I will touch upon that very briefly later. So on to my second topic, uh, which is the basis of the authority for obtaining a warrant, which uh, would exercise most police officers uh, across the globe. I can obviously only um, detail with a reasonable amount of uh, accuracy with the position in England and Wales. If I explain this very briefly, I hope you will understand where some of the problems arise. The relevant act in the, in the UK uh, is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, as subsequently amended over the years. And Section 19 gives a general power of seizure. Uh, this act, by the way, uh, as with all legislation, is available online on the UK government website. Um, I'm not going to go into precisely what uh, Section 9 allows you to do, but the interesting thing and the most important thing are the powers that the constable have. First of all, the, ca the constable must, must be on the premises lawfully, and they must also have a, a valid reason for wanting to obtain the data. The question is, what can they obtain? Well, Section 19.4 says that a constable may require any information which is stored in any electronic form and is accessible from the premises to be produced in a form which can be taken away and which is visible and legible. So that means any form means it can be scanned images or hard disks. Accessible from the premises means the computer is connected to the internet or and linked to a website. And of course, being in a legible form covers encrypted data. So um, you, some of you may be aware uh, that we also have um, a requirement under the Regulation of Investigative Powers Act if an order is issued that somebody should give up um, their password to encrypted data. Um, now this section, section 9, 19, only deals with the, uh, the data, not the physical items such as a computer, which is dealt with in section 20. Now the problem that arises from this is who can be compelled to produce the material? Is it the occupier? Is it the owner of the computer upon which the data is stored? Is it the ISP on whose file debt server the data is stored? Or is it all of them? Well, the answer actually would depend very much on the precise powers being used and the terms of any relevant statute that's being um, uh, operated on. Um, so this just illustrates in a very, very quick, brief way the complexity of the issue. A second problem is that certainly under the law of England and Wales, uh, at one time, a constable might be exposed to a civil action for trespass against items that were seized and later shown to be exempt from seizure, which obviously is quite a difficult issue. This particular problem now has been addressed by sections 50, 51 and 52 of the Criminal Justice and Police Act 2001. Uh, and this, as a lot of um, of you listening at the moment uh, who are based in uh, the Cyber Crime Convention 
signatories will know is now covered by the Convention on Cybercrime, Articles 19.2 uh, and 22.1d. And in fact, um, the sections 50, 51 and 52 I mentioned now actually incorporate the Convention of Cybercrime uh, into UK law. So the section 52 deals with property found on the premises and provides that when a person is lawfully on the premises and they find property they would be entitled to seize, but it also includes something that is no power to seize. So it could be, for instance, you're entitled to seize the data but not to seize the item, which could be a smartphone or a computer. Uh, but it is not practical for the two items to be separated, then you can seize the property, uh, which is obviously quite an important issue. Uh, the rationale for that, this, uh, especially with obtaining evidence that may be in another jurisdiction which is actually on a computer, is that the investigator is merely observing the fact that the server continues to do what it was caused to do by the accused. So if the accused is actually on a website which is uh, illegal for some reason um, and it continues to be on when the constable is uh, in the room, uh, then the constable has the right to continue with that activity. And this position remains so, providing the investigator does not cause the server to do anything else. So the investigator must be passive. Now the continuity remains from the point in time the accused um, connected to the server to the point in time that the investigator seizes the computer. And of course, providing the investigator does not give any instructions to the server, they do not alter the original function. And of course, all the all the investigator is doing at this stage is storing the information that is being sent from the server to the computer. Um, so that uh, it, it certainly for, for the position in UK is now fairly well um, established. So to go on now, um, the only problem is ownership is not always clear but uh, that um, Jai, Jai is going to discuss later and we, we may be asked to comment, so I won't take any more time on that particular issue. Uh, so regardless of the physical location, uh, you can still obtain the data. There is a Danish case that ca in, in that respect, uh, which is reported in my journal. Regarding mutual legal assistance, which is my third point, um, I'm not going to pay say very much of this, other than um, those of you who are listening who are involved in this area will know uh, that some countries deal with mutual legal aid assistance under a treaty very, very slowly. There can be quite a significant length of delay. The, the also though, from the a party who is making the application, there can be a failure to make an appropriate application. And this actually is, is more significant and happens more frequently than people would like to admit. And also there is a failure to fill out forms properly. This is certainly where if you had an online form uh, with specific boxes that has to be, have to be filled in in a particular way with particular information would alleviate some of those stresses, obviously. Um, I know one country, um, my own England and Wales, the UK generally, uh, we do have a member of the Crown Prosecution Service permanently positioned and located in Washington DC in the United States and they act as a liaison officer to obtain evidence from US organizations when asked to do so by the British police. That can obviously be a fairly expensive option but nevertheless it does work quite well apparently. The fourth point I'm making is the admissibility of digital data as evidence. Um, now, having uh, looked at um, well over 45 to 50 jurisdictions in detail through my books and also uh, editing my journal, I can say with a high degree of certainty that admissibility is not really an issue in most jurisdictions. Uh, there are some, some, some issues that arise in some jurisdictions, um, uh, but they are too peculiar to that particular ju jurisdiction. Uh, and no doubt if the United Nations or maybe Europe worked on a convention on electronic evidence, that might be resolved. Um, the fifth point, which I think is quite important in my last uh, 90 seconds, is do we all understand the importance of the data stored in the cloud? We do understand that, but our legal system is ready and able to accept, interpret, and apply it. And that is a very mixed bag. 
and I'm sure uh, most of the people listening to this will understand some jurisdictions are better at accepting and um, uh, interpreting uh, the data and some ju jurisdictions are not. Uh, and this is where a great deal of more work needs to be done, especially in education of judges and lawyers, uh, which is the main focus of what I'm trying to do uh, in the last two or three years. So, Shaheef, uh, with that, I'll leave that at, at that at, um, at my fifth point. But we have a sixth point which will need me allow uh, me to ask you to take over from me. Because we've got to, obviously, I haven't looked at the challenge of forensically preserving data, and there are several issues that arise from this, obviously, such as what is forensic data preservation. Some of our listeners obviously will know about that. Obviously, there's a qu question about the process of repeatability for cloud evidence and um, who uploaded the data, for instance, establishing who it is. So, Shaheef, with that, I'll hand over to, to you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, mm, yes, definitely, um, the forensic preservation uh, of data is uh, is critical. And if we want to lay out the, the four main points uh, that are relevant, uh, that define forensic preservation, then I, I I would say that are not changing the evidence on the source, making sure that uh, the data you preserve is authentic and is not manipulated. Explaining the process that uh, that you took and the ability to repeat uh, the process, and as as you mentioned, uh, Stephen, um, one of the challenges with the cloud, uh, with cloud data being uh, volatile and constantly changing, is the ability to repeat the process. Because uh, if you to do a, a snapshot of the cloud this morning and you do a snapshot of the cloud later this afternoon. It probably will not look the same. People might uh, change data, might add data. So the question of whether the repeatability is something that uh, is necessarily a part of uh, forensically preserving the data, it's, it's one, of, uh, one of the challenges. One of the resolutions that I have heard along the way is that, uh, first of all, we all need to understand that we are taking a snapshot. And um, if no one, uh, if uh, someone is defining the boundaries and assuming no one is deleting the data, then you can repeat a snapshot in the, in the past using a different, uh, different uh, tools. So definitely uh, and, um, uh, repeatability is, is one uh, of, of the challenges. Then defending the, the authenticity of the data, which we'll, uh, we will refer later uh, in this, uh, this uh, session and how you can uh, make sure that uh, what are the best practice for forensic cloud uh, preservation. Um, I would like um, to touch at, uh, at this point some question that uh, some of our people uh, had. Uh, so, Stephen, one of, one of the questions was uh, uh, if you can explain what is the difference between a user and an owner. You mentioned that in the beginning of your, uh, uh, your uh, section. Uh, yes. Um, uh, if we just take um, your average um, heroin dealer, um, most will have five, six, or seven mobile telephones. Uh, some of them they might deliberately bo borrow from other people uh, for various purposes. Uh, they will try to make them all anonymous for obvious reasons. And so uh, a dealer that has um, let's say a girlfriend or even a boyfriend um, uh, and might want to do something on their telephone, uh, i.e. the girlfriend's telephone, you have to distinguish between the user and the owner. Now, a lot of people speak in very general terms that uh, when you record a telephone conversation, for instance, or you record the number of uh, telephone uh, conversations that are initiated and you have the recording of the actual telephones connected and what time they were connected, all the metadata, that it it was the person who owned the telephone that made that call or is responsible for it, which is not correct uh, because it is the device itself, or better still, the chip inside and the software in the, in the device that is making the connections, not necessarily a human being and you've got to actually connect the human being 
to the act. And some people will deliberately try to make that more difficult for the police to ascertain. So there is a need sometimes to ascertain the owner and uh, the user. And it's particularly important, obviously, in civil proceedings where you think uh, that a theft is, being, is taking place of intellectual property from your organization. The organization will probably own the device, but not always, because if you have bring your own device policy, uh, the um, employee might have information actually on their smartphone, their personal smartphone, which belongs to the organization. So this is quite an important issue that should not be uh, ignored. Lovely. Th th thank you, uh, Stephen, for that uh, explanation. Uh, Pamela, b briefly looking for, from your insight uh, in, in Singapore and the experience that, that you have with respect to Legal found, uh, Foundation, uh, anything you would like to share on, on this uh, topic? Yes, thank you, Sharaf. Um, I think having listened to Stephen, um, we've obviously been looking at the basis on which law enforcement agencies, and there will be regulators of various industries as well as the police and maybe the anti-competition authorities, tend to have very broad or fairly broad powers to conduct dawn raids and to um, enforce search orders and search warrants and to seize data. Um, so we, we, we have been looking at how, to what extent they can get into the computers and, and, and seize computers. And those, those powers seem to tend, tend to be quite broad. I mean, for example, in China, um, there, there, there are not that detailed laws. And um, if, if you get a dawn raid, basically, um, pretty much everything is up for grabs, so to speak. Lovely. Um, thank you. So I would like to move to our next topic, which is who is the owner of the data and with respect to that, um, uh, is it the, the individual itself? Is it the cloud provider? Is it, you know, the, the, the user of the data? What about uh, uh, metadata? Uh, uh, who is the owner of that? Uh, Jai, would you, would you care to take the lead? Certainly. Thanks, Shahaf. So every time an individual logs in and uses the services provided by a cloud-based services provider, they are providing that provider with an enormous amount of data, in particular information about themselves, such as their names, their phone numbers and where they live, and in many cases all the same information about all of their family and friends. Now all of this information is what is commonly described as personal data, which under many laws usually includes includes information about an individual who can be identified from that information or from that information combined with some other information. On top of this, individuals provide cloud-based service providers with an enormous amount of underlying data, as Stephen described, about where they log in, what time they access their accounts and for how long, who they contact and other such information. In some cases, as demonstrated by a recent decision of the Australian Privacy Commissioner, this metadata may also be regarded as personal data. So then, given all of this information being provided to cloud-based service providers, who owns that personal data? Under English law and the laws of many other jurisdictions, there are no property rights as such in personal data and therefore it is somewhat incorrect to talk about who owns that information. Such information, such as my name, just is. So instead what we talk about is control and, and who is able to control personal data. Now ultimately, control of that data rests with the individual to whom it relates. However, when we sign up to a Hotmail or a Facebook or some such other similar service, we give consent to the cloud-based service provider to collect, use and disclose our personal data for a particular purpose. The consent we give will also reflect applicable laws and regulations about what the service providers must do in relation to personal data. And most data protection laws give rights to individuals in relation to their processing of their data and organisations that collect such data may have legal obligations to process it in a certain way, including limits on how it uses, holds and transfers the data. 
Therefore, while we may retain ultimate control over our personal data, every time we sign up to a new web-based email account or something similar, we're handing that control over to the relevant cloud-based provider who is accountable to us for the use and protection of our data in line with the consent given when we sign up to their services. But what many of us may not consider when signing up to a new online service is what the cloud-based service provider then does with our information once it's handed over. Now while we all believe and have confidence that cloud-based service providers will protect the privacy of our information, their business models, as will be reflected in their terms and conditions that we agree to when we first use the services, means that data will regularly be shifted around the world so that the personal data of someone sitting in Singapore, for example, may be hosted by a cloud-based service provider based in the United States on any of its services, servers across a number of countries and continents. Now, this gives rise to a number of issues when law enforcement agencies wish to access such data in the context of an investigation. So first, let's consider the scenario of the law enforcement agency in one country wanting to access information about an individual being hosted by a cloud-based provider in the same country. Although data protection and privacy laws are not uniform across the globe, most will allow the disclosure of personal data to law enforcement agencies where this is required for ensuring public safety and security. In most cases, such disclosure will be in response to a, a warrant or a subpoena or something similar. For example, under the EU Directive on Personal Data, Article 13 pro provides such an exception that member states may adopt legislative measures to restrict the scope of the obligations of data controllers and the rights of data subjects when necessary to safeguard national security, defence, public security, or the prevention, investigation, detection, and prosecution of criminal offences. However, in most cases, it is only local law enforcement agencies that are allowed to obtain such personal data. For a foreign law enforcement agency to then access that personal data hosted in another country, it must go through the MLAT route, as Stephen described, or some such other mechanism whereby the host country agrees to the foreign enforcement agency undertaking investigations in its territory. Now, this reflects the fact that in most cases, even outside of the, the cloud context, a law enforcement agency cannot simply conduct an investigation, including interviewing witnesses or obtaining evidence from abroad without the consent of the jurisdiction in which it wishes to conduct such investigation. However, as Stephen noted, the MLAT process is criticised as being a bit too slow and unresponsive at times for dynamic law enforcement investigations. A notable exception to going through this route exists under the Cybercrime Convention, which allows foreign law enforcement agencies to access information if it is publicly available, of course, or if they obtain the lawful and voluntary consent of the individual concerned. In addition to the MLAT route and access permitted under the Cybercrime Convention, a number of court judgments have upheld the right of law enforcement agencies to access data from cloud service providers even where that data is hosted outside the requesting state. So in what is now quite a famous case um, involving Microsoft in the United States, US federal court allowed the US government to access the email account of a Microsoft customer whose account was in fact hosted in Ireland because that information was under the control of Microsoft, which is based in the US. So what issues arise if a foreign law enforcement agency seeks to obtain personal data from the cloud when it is hosted outside that law enforcement agency's territory without it going through the MLAT route, without a court permitting such access or without consent or if it's publicly available. First, if a foreign law enforcement agency directly access data outside of the MLAT route or without some other permission or consent, it may cause the cloud-based service provider from which the data is accessed to be in breach of local data protection and privacy laws. It is important to note here that in its opinion on cloud computing um, from 2012, the EU's Article 29 Data Protection Working Party stated that it's of the utmost importance that in the data protection regulation, which is now being finalised and negotiated, it be made clear that data controllers operating in the EU 
be prohibited from disclosing personal data to a third country if so requested by that third country's judicial or administrative authorities unless this is expressly authorised by an international agreement or provided for by the MLAT, which would therefore give some legal certainty for the individuals whose personal data are stored in data centres all over the world. It is likely that countries with very strict data protection or privacy laws will object to the access of personal data that is hosted in their jurisdiction without the party seeking such access adhering to and complying with local legal procedures. In addition, accessing a device or a network without appropriate authorization is, in many countries, a criminal offence. For example, in Singapore, where I'm sitting, the Computer Misuse and Cybersecurity Act makes it a criminal offence to cause a computer to perform any function for the purpose of securing access without authority to any data held in any computer. This law has extraterritorial effect so that it applies within and outside Singapore as long as the relevant computer or data is located within Singapore. While such laws are aimed primarily at preventing, detecting and countering cyber attacks, it is clear they may also apply in the case of law enforcement agencies accessing data in the cloud without consent. So with that in mind, there is clearly an inherent opposition between law enforcement agencies having unfettered access to data for the purposes of conducting lawful investigations wherever it may be located on the one hand, and this fundamental right in many countries to privacy and protection of personal data. In the wake of the revelations by Edward Snowden and through WikiLeaks about the widespread collection of data, including personal data by many countries, it is more, not less likely, that governments will be keen to ensure that foreign governments do not access data hosted in their territory without going through a proper legal process, reflecting the sentiments expressed by the Article 29 Working Party, even if this means foreign law enforcement agencies cannot readily access such information for otherwise legitimate purposes of criminal investigations. On the other hand, it is conceivable that some courts may support law enforcement agencies to use technology that enables direct extraction of cloud-based data, rather than protecting the privacy of the individual in all circumstances or the sovereignty of the state in which the data is hosted. If a law enforcement agency is given the right, through a search warrant, to access information on or through a suspect's device, it is possible that a court may view that data, wherever it may actually be hosted, as being intrinsic to the phone and therefore subject to a legitimate data access request. Lovely. Um, that's that's extremely extreme, extremely interesting. You know, the fact is who is owning the data and where where the data uh, actually resides and the uh, what's the jurisdiction around the, around it. And I think uh, this is a further uh, or a direct uh, uh, connection to, to our next topic, which is what are the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional restriction uh, for cloud-based uh, for cloud-based based data? How is jurisdiction uh, is determined? Jai, uh, you touched upon that, uh, uh, and uh, and based on uh, is it based on the location of the data, the user, or the, or, or the provider itself? Uh, Pamela, would would you like to continue the discussion in, in in that direction, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sharaf. Um, jurisdiction is 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 a very interesting question, and particularly because if a law enforcement agency, whether it's the police or the anti-competition agency or those who are um, looking at corruption, um, they, they they will want to obviously sees information and in, for their investigation and query whether they can actually they have the jurisdiction or the right and the power to see certain information and um, on what basis do they have that power now obviously Stephen talked about the legal basis but very often in order to maybe serve a search warrant or to actually go in and seize documents you have to have jurisdiction so the question is on what basis do law enforcement agencies or courts who will then obviously be making the orders of the search warrants have jurisdiction? And, and usually jurisdiction is based on a nexus. There has to be some 
sufficient nexus between the, the country which is ordering um, or the law enforcement agency within which country you know, the, 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 the acts are happening and the, the data. So number one, if the data is obviously situated in a certain country, let's say in um, Singapore, then the law enforcement agencies are likely to have jurisdiction over that data and can um, seize that data. So that's, 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 that's fairly, fairly easy. Uh, if the data owner is within the jurisdiction, then you can obviously serve a subpoena or a search warrant on the data or owner and can establish jurisdiction even if the data owner might be hosting um, the data somewhere outside the jurisdiction. So that's a way of asserting jurisdiction. If the cloud service provider, and I think um, Jai obviously mentioned the Microsoft case. Microsoft is a U.S. company. He, there the U.S. court served a search warrant on Microsoft based on the fact that the cloud service provider was incorporated, was doing business in that country. So that's a way of asserting jurisdiction. The fact that the documents were hosted in Ireland was as far as the U.S. courts were concerned, neither here nor there. They, they, it was sufficient that Microsoft, the cloud service provider, was in um, the U.S. That's obviously a case that is now working its way through a number of appeals, so it, 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 it waits to be seen whether that stands up. Um, other um, basis on which one could possibly assert jurisdiction is if the criminal offense took place within the jurisdiction. That's slightly trickier um, because, yes, you have the jurisdiction to investigate the offense, but do you have jurisdiction over data that might be outside the jurisdiction? Um, but that might, again, be a nexus, and I think that the case that um, Stephen referred to, the Danish case, very much was based on the fact that the tort happened in De Denmark, and, and, and there was a feeling that one could then sees data that was outside Denmark um, via computers. Uh, maybe where the data is created, that might also be a nexus. If the data was created by someone within the jurisdiction, um, that, that might be something that would, would, would compel courts to say, yes, um, the law enforcement agencies can seize that data. So there's, you, you have to look for a nexus. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some are nexuses that have been um, recognized as establishing jurisdiction and some might be a bit more tenuous. Um, so, so that's a bit sort of about jurisdiction. Um, Sharaf, I think one other thing that we wanted to talk about is um, whether one could sort of look at the logical presence of a service provider, is that right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, whether and I think it's it's uh, very much like uh, the 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 Danish case I think that uh, Stefan mentioned and the fact that whether the fact that uh, the service provider resides in your country let's say that Facebook resides in in in, in Singapore uh, uh, does it mean anything in terms of uh, jurisdiction? Yeah, I think this is again an interesting one because, for example, let's let's take um, Yahoo or uh, and there there is a Belgian case, Yahoo, which is I think pretty much on point, where Yahoo is um, I think I'm right in saying that they're established in the U.S., um, but they obviously direct their services all over the world, uh, and and the Belgian court says is we're we're going to serve a uh, summons on you to. Um, reveal the identity of one of your users, and Yahoo said, well, you don't have jurisdiction over us. We're in the U.S. If you want anything from us, any information from us, you have to go through the MLAT route. And the Belgian court says, no, 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 we, you are virtually present in Belgium because you are directing services to Belgium. Um, because in order to in any way serve an order on someone, you have to have jurisdiction over that company or individual. And either that, and that usually is the case that that company or individual is incorporated or doing business in your jurisdiction. Um, the virtual presence is, an, again, an interesting one because it, there are rules definitely in civil proceedings under, for example, the Brussels regulation 
which allows courts to take jurisdiction over companies which are directing their e-commerce into a certain country. So if it's uh, Amazon who's situated in the US and they're selling things into Germany, on you know, a German website, it's, it's, it's in German, then they are subject to the jurisdiction of the German courts because they have decided to direct their services into that country. So that there, there definitely is a precedent of virtual presence. Query whether one can also use that in the criminal context because there's the, the, the very, I think, important difference between civil proceedings and criminal proceedings is that countries tend to be a bit more sensitive about law enforcement agencies, which are obviously state agencies, states um, governed or, 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 or uh, controlled operations to start seizing documents which are outside their territory. That's, is, that's why search warrants tend to be restricted to the territory of the country. It's a question of the sovereignty of the country. In civil court proceedings, you have private parties, they're having a dispute, and they are required to provide information via court orders. Um, they will then more or less voluntarily provide that information, but it's not a state power going into another country and seizing documents. And that's why I think um, it's, it's a bit more difficult to use those more civil proceedings related um, examples which allow jurisdiction over someone who's virtually present in sort of a criminal context. So I think, um, Shahaf, you mentioned um, when we were talking about the webinar, a very interesting little scenario says where you said, um, let's assume someone is bullying or insulting a Singapore citizen um, on Facebook. It's all happening in um, Singapore, basically two Singaporean citizens. So, so, so there's a tort, there's a crime happening in Singapore. Um, why should one apply U.S. law simply on the basis that Facebook is situated in the U.S. and might be holding the information on a U.S. server or maybe definitely a server outside Singapore. And I think the answer to that one is you've got to look at the difference between where is the crime committed and obviously the Singapore law will determine is there a crime and can we prosecute that crime and where is the evidence situated. And if you want to start seizing evidence that is outside the Singaporean jurisdiction you wouldn't you usually use the lex situs, so the, the law of the place where the data or the evidence is situated. And this is obviously a huge challenge in relation to cloud because very often um, people don't know or don't care where the documents or the data is situated. They have a com computer in Singapore, they can access the information and for all intents and purposes, the information is in Singapore. The fact that it happens to be stored on a computer in the US or in China or Russia is something that's pretty much hidden and almost, um, you know, it, it's not something intentional. It's, it's, the, 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 the cloud providers will move the documents or the data around depending on st where they've got some, some space, some storage space. So you, you can see courts possibly taking the view well, you know, if you can access the information through a device in country, um, and as Jai said, then that data is within our jurisdiction. And I know that, for example, the European Competition um, Commission, um, they do take that view. If you can access it um, easily on a day-to-day -day basis from a computer within Europe, then it doesn't matter that the data happens to be hosted in the US. It is, can be seized by the European Competition Commission. So uh, it, it, the cloud and the internet is, is, is throwing up a lot of issues, which I think the courts are having to grapple with based on laws that were written before the cloud existed. Yeah, yeah I, I agree that, you know, the more I personally hear about it, the more I talk uh, 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 with you about it, you know, the more I find it more, more fascinating. I know it's a, it's a big headache uh, uh, trying to deal with, with, with that, but uh, there are so many uh, variations uh, around the jurisdiction and how it's determined and, and the, the ownership of, of the data 
and and wow, it's it is amazing. Stephen, anything you would like to to mention with respect to the jurisdiction? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, hey, um, yes. Thanks very much, Pamela. Um, uh, Pamela mentioned the Yahoo case. Um, the Yahoo case now has gone through, um, I think, six judgments. I have published each judgment in a translation into English in my journal, um, so it's just a matter of downloading them off the internet for free. Uh, a seventh judgment has yet to be made, uh, so there is no definitive answer to the Yahoo case yet. Um, and interestingly, my um, editor in um, Belgium in May this year informed me that another case, very similar to the Yahoo case, has been launched against Skype in Belgium. Um, in essence, the argument by Yahoo was, look, we do not have offices in Belgium, we have no physical presence in Belgium, therefore we're not a, a Belgian law doesn't apply to us. And both the prosecutor, who I know very well, Jan Kirchhoff, and also the, the investigating magistrate, Philippe, who I also know, um, are both um, opposed to that uh, position, uh, and they are quite rigorous in trying to establish that the seven email accounts they want uh, Yahoo to give up to them uh, should be done so under Belgian law, regardless of the fact that Yahoo is has a physical presence in Belgium, which illustrates the point neatly, really, I think. Indeed. Um, great. Thank you for, for sharing that uh, additional uh, info. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we, we have uh, the, the experts uh, here that uh, they are up to date with the most relevant cases, so I, uh, I do uh, suggest to the rest of uh, the audience, you know, to, to keep tracking uh, Pamela Jai and, and Stephen, and uh, I, sure, I, sure, I sure do and learn every, every time some, something new. Um, the, the last topic that we wanted to, to discuss is more, uh, is less around the um, uh, legal, it's more, more, more around the, the processes and the, and the methods for acquiring uh, data and what are the best practices for forensic uh, uh, cloud extraction, and I'll, I'll take the lead uh, on this uh, on this uh, topic. So um, we, we mentioned, um, I mentioned some of the challenges with uh, the forensic data preservation, but uh, with looking into forensic cloud extraction, the first thing that uh, that I, I would say, and I think this is part of the reason that uh, we at Celebrite uh, thought it would be useful to have uh, this. Uh, a panel over here to discuss the legalities to make sure you get legal authority to gain access uh, into the cloud in your, uh, in your in your country and you've heard that there are different methods and there are different ways to look into that and uh, each uh, interpret it uh, uh, a little bit uh, di different uh, differently. Once you get the legal uh, authority then it's question about getting the relevant data in the right time. So some of the of, of the challenges, you know, with respect to the current legal uh, system and the way that uh, it needs to apply specifically, you know, if you need to go through an MLAT process, is how much time is, ta is it taking you to get the information from the cloud. Uh, with some of the people that we have discussed uh, uh, around the world, this task can take a few months to a year, uh, especially if you do not reside in the same country as the cloud uh, as the cloud provider, and this gives you a question. You know, is whether this information would be actually valuable for you for the time of the the investigation, and uh, and as we've seen in most of the cases, cloud information is very important. So you need to find out the ways and the tools you know to to provide you with the, the information uh, in the right timing, uh, again under uh, working under under the legal uh, the legal authority, uh, which also relates to the fact uh, that um, when you do the forensic extraction of of, of the data, you want um, uh, to be sure that um, uh, you comply with that with that legal authority, both in terms of the the time frame that this legal authority suggests, but also in terms of of the uh, the amount of data that can can be can be produced. The third point related to the forensic uh, extraction is with respect to data uh, authenticity. So, uh, when you when Celebrite uh, is, is producing uh, software uh, and uh, and uh, hardware for 
extracting uh, information from mobile device and then analyzing that. So when you have the mobile device or when you have the, uh, the, the PC, this is very, very easy because you have the evidence in your, your hand and you know where is the data. And it's very easy to, to correlate the, the data to, to, to the device itself. But what happens when, when the data is, is in the cloud? How do you correlate uh, that, that uh, data to somewhere that you don't know where, uh, where, it, where it is? Not to mention that it might be stored on several uh, server with several uh, copies. So you need to be sure that when you are uh, applying uh, processes to acquire data for, from the cloud, you want to be sure that data is authentic. You want to make sure that you are getting uh, uh, that you are containing the data in some kind of format that uh, you know it uh, uh, did not change or will not uh, or will not change across time. You want to make you make sure that. Um, you collect some metadata around this data, so you will be able to cross correlate uh, uh, with other uh, sources. And obviously, you will, uh, you will always want to be sure that uh, uh, you are making the right uh, uh, validation to whatever tool that you are using, even if it's a manual tool that uh, mean basically go into Facebook website and pull out information uh, from there. So eventually, you want to, to be sure that what you are using is something that you can uh, you can send uh, stand behind. The, f the fourth point, with respect to the um, um, to the best practices, would be traceability. So you want to be sure that you document everything that uh, that, that you are doing, uh, doing, and you will be able to, if not reproduce the same process, uh, you would like to um, uh, be able to uh, at least show what are the methods and what are the steps that you've taken across the way in order to achieve that data. This is very important for you. This is, I know that uh, for some of our law enforcement customers, this is, takes most of uh, their time and therefore we want to be sure that uh, if you're using uh, uh, tools uh, for that, uh, you, you would want to be sure that those tools are actually uh, doing some of the documentation uh, for, for themselves so you can use that and then uh, use it in, in uh, in court. Um, with that sense, you know, I just want to touch a little bit about technology. I know that uh, uh, some of you had questions uh, around that. So, briefly discussing in high level what kind of methods you, you have today in order to gain access uh, uh, into the cloud. Uh, and this is a side of uh, uh, going to the uh, service uh, provider and asking for the, for, for the information. So, basically, and obviously, again, I'm, I'm saying everything uh, under the, uh, the assumption that you got your legal authority to gain access in, in, in into, in, into the cloud and uh, you are not obviously making anything le uh, legal. And uh, again, I hope that uh, the, the last hour conversation was uh, useful for you to understand what kind of uh, things you can do and you can apply and you can uh, uh, work with. So with respect to the kind of solution, so first of all, you can obviously um, go and manually browse through the web interface of the um, of the cloud provider and start putting information. Again, you need to be sure that you are tracking, tracking every, every step uh, of the process and you want to be sure that the data that you are uh, capturing is eventually forensically pre preserved so no one can say, hey, you are the one that uh, impl uh, implemented that picture on that uh, specific uh, website. Uh, for those uh, those reasons, you know, um, uh, 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 we at Celebrite came with a tool that we call uh, UFL Cloud Analyzer that basically allows you that kind of capturing of uh, private uh, cloud data in the cloud. I will not go too much in, uh, into this tool. I will just mention that then Cloud Analyzer, again, working under the right uh, certain uh, um, uh, legal authorities will enable you instant access into cloud data. Uh, this is with a username and password or utilizing information that was on, was on the mobile uh, that allows you the key to access uh, the information uh, in the cloud. Uh, for those of you that want further information about it, uh, we will conduct a webinar a couple of weeks uh, specifically about the technology so you can further reference uh, that information. With that being said, um, Quickly, um, Jai, Pamela, uh, Stephen, any final uh, final word as uh, we're approaching the last couple of minutes of our uh, discussion? 
I have a final one, which um, hopefully um, both um, Jai and, and Pamela might agree with. Um, um, certainly, I'll introduce your comments very briefly. When it comes to uh, private investigations, i.e. non-criminal investigations, one of the issues that always arose when I started in this area some 10, 15 years ago was whether or not you should forensically um, image uh, computers for civil proceedings. Um, and that's a very difficult question uh, to, um, to answer because it depends on whether or not the data is going to be uh, challenged, the authenticity of the data is going to be challenged uh, in due course. And so you're caught as a civil organization with the in the impossible position of establishing the authenticity of the evidence if you haven't obtained it in the way that you do it, for instance, as a company. Um, but if you do it um, properly uh, in the way that the police do, uh, then that, of course, is quite an expensive experience. For all of our uh, participants uh, around the world, thank you again so much for uh, joining us uh, this uh, morning, afternoon, evening, depending on your, your area. Uh, I learned a lot this uh, session. I hope it was as useful for you as it was uh, for me. Special thanks, uh, Pamela, Jai, Stephen. I take my head uh, off uh, for, uh, for the great uh, session that we have today. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope to speak uh, with all of you uh, uh, soon, uh, whether in person or over a, a webinar.